Welcome to day two of the live show here on the internet. We're streaming live to four channels. So let me break down what's gonna happen today. So if you were here yesterday, you saw that we basically had a whole bunch of new demos on Docker 1903. That's what we're doing all this week for three days of streaming. And I get guests every day and we talk about different stuff. And if you're this is your first time checking out this kind of thing live, then you will see me live on the internet every Thursday where I talk about Docker containers, Kubernetes, and all that. So I'm gonna be your host today. My name is Brett Fisher. I have a channel on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, you might be on Docker's or my channel because we're streaming all over the place. And I've got some exciting guests today, but real quick, before we get started, I want you to start thinking about questions because this if you're watching live, then you get to interact with us and ask questions about new features and the latest Docker release that came out last week. And we're going to be talking about stuff in the Docker command line, stuff with Docker desktop and servers and deploying stuff. So it's going to be a whole range of topics today that I'm pretty excited to get started on. So get your questions in early. We will be looking at the chat throughout the, this hour. We'll basically be here for a full hour talking about new stuff. And let me bring in our guest. So today on the show, I've got Marcos. You've, you've seen him before if you've watched my YouTube live. He's over there on the left and in the middle. We've got Joe from Docker. Joe is the director of engineering, and he's going to be sharing some really cool new features in the 1903 release of Docker Desktop Enterprise. Hello, guys. Hey, how are you, Brett? Good, good. Uh, so first up, we've got Joe. He's uh, actually, um, where are you from in, uh, today? I forget. Uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, yeah. So he's in, uh, you're in the Docker office there, right? Yep, that's right. And uh, Joe is uh, going to talk a, best, a little bit about clustering. So this is a brand new thing in Docker Desktop where we've never really had a command line interface to create server clusters. And you know, before, we basically had little tools like Docker Machine, which would spin up a single instance. But this is, this is nothing like that, right, Joe? Right, right. Of course, it, uh, it goes you know, sort of that next level of uh, additional functionality to you know, sort of take care of the entire lifecycle management of a cluster like we do with containers and services. Yeah, and this, from my understanding, the history of this was around um, the DCI that I think I talked a lot about last year, the Docker Certified Infrastructure, and this is sort of the evolution of that, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, the first sort of DCI templates and scripts we, uh, we published, we got a lot of good feedback uh, from those, and uh, it was largely around, okay, well, I don't want to learn like a whole nother set of tooling and such. I mean, thanks for the scripts and templates. They'll definitely be useful. Uh, so we did an internal uh, sort of revision three or uh, two, sorry, uh, where we put it all into a container and then we uh, provided just a very simple command line interface to it. And so in this uh, iteration, which we call Docker cluster, um, we're providing a declarative uh, syntax to basically model the entire cluster. So so you can um, add, subtract nodes, uh, instant load balancers, and, and such. Right. So it's uh, it really cleans up the entire experience. Great. Um, I know that a lot of us, uh, you know, once we get past that Docker 101 and we learn about building our containers and deploying our images to registries, that's one of the next big questions is where do I put it? <laughs> and uh, I think that along the learning journey, as well as those that are just uh, more sysadmin ops like myself, where they're focused more on the infrastructure side, trying to figure out how do I, you know, how do I build out clusters of of advanced solutions that aren't just sort of a basic machine with Docker running, right? And exactly. um, I, I, I guess that's what this is really focused around, right? This is more about the enterprise clusters and not so much a, a one-off machine with Docker running on it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Docker machine is uh, the, the current you know, one off for, for Docker running uh, that I would say you should use. Uh, we, we have another tool that we demoed at DockerCon called uh, Docker Jump, uh, which also uses a lot of these uh, same technology stacks that I've been describing. Uh, that one's, we're still working on uh, improving that. Uh, and I think we'll have some pretty exciting announcements in about six months or so. Hmm, cool. You're yeah. here first. <laughs> six months. You put it on the internet, it's forever. So now, now we're going to be back here in six months. Uh, well, uh, Joe, so I, I know you have some demos to, to show. And of course, you know, this, everybody's watching. So let's, let's dive in. What, what do you have to show us? Sure. Of course. Um, are we all set? 
to see my screen, or do I need to click a button? Yeah, let me click some buttons. So, yeah, you should be able to share your screen in Skype, and then I should uh, see that. All right. Great. All right. Okay, so, you know, the place where most people start is by running Docker. And uh, with 19.03, we added the ability to put uh, CLI plugins uh, into Docker itself. So you can add additional functionality. So we wrapped up all the functionality from DCI and put it in uh, a tool we call uh, Cluster. So if we take a look at the functionality there, Docker Cluster. Uh, we have, you know, create, create a cluster. We can inspect the clusters we have. Uh, we can list the ones we have. Uh, some of the key features here, being able to back up and restore clusters so that, you know, if something goes wrong, you can always get back to a known uh, good state. Um, and then, you know, over the life cycle of the cluster, being able to add nodes, remove nodes, upgrade from 1903 to, you know, 1909 or whatever the next iteration will be. Um, and that includes all of our uh, offering as well as, you know, UCP, DTR, uh, just making that whole upgrade experience seamless as possible. Um, so what does one of these uh, declarations look like? Uh, take a look at the uh, script I have prepared here. Uh, so we have, you know, sort of a high level concept of variables where you can assign values so you can make templates for your uh, for your clusters. Um, and then as you deploy them, you can sort of fill out unique values. Uh, passwords, of course, we want to keep secret, so we won't bake that into our declaration. Uh, basic configuration to talk to AWS. Um, what region are you wanting to deploy in? Let's add some tags. Uh, Docker, we have a tool called Reaper that uh, kills off old clusters, so I have to let it know that this is a pet and uh, it's under the DCI project, so please don't kill it, Reaper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so then uh, in terms of the cluster, we can specify the engine version we're wanting to provide, uh, UCP, um, you know, the version we're wanting to uh, install there. Uh, in this example, just for uh, brevity, um, I'm only going to be installing UCP. DTR will also uh, could also be installed, um, but again, we we don't want to take all day watching the installer go. Uh, so then the resource types uh, we can do AWS instances, we can do AWS spot instance requests to save some cash, uh, we can do AWS uh, load balancers and uh, DNS provisioning directly in here. Um, so we could put a you know if you wanted your apps dot domain.com, uh, we could have that pre-provisioned with uh, certificates provided by Let's Encrypt. So really the, the whole thing of all those different technologies are, are coming together under the uh, under the hood here uh, with, with a Docker cluster. So what you'll get is, you know, you'll get those resources. Um, it will also create what's called a Docker context for you. So you can then switch your Docker uh, client to that context and uh, be able to interact with the cluster immediately. Um, so we'll uh, take a break from looking at that and uh, I'll fire off, uh, here I'll reset the screen, Docker cluster create, uh, given that this Docker and DevOps show, and we'll call it um, plus, uh, we'll call it bread. Uh, so we need to provide our UCP password, and I'm entering it in securely. So there we go. It'll talk to Hub to look up the licenses that I have available. Um, it'll start planning the cluster on AWS, and then uh, we'll start seeing this little bar uh, going from left to right, letting us know that resources are provisioning. Um, and in uh, cooking show style, we'll take a look at the clusters we have available. And I've already set up a demo one in the background, so we can go ahead and take a look at that right now. Um, do, 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 do. And so there uh, we can see this is a, when we inspect the cluster, we basically get a reflection of uh, of the cluster uh, declaration that we've provided to create with. 
in addition to all the different uh, parameters that were had default values uh, that got resolved throughout the uh, uh, operation of the creation. So for instance, uh, there were some Kubernetes options that got resolved because they're defaults. Uh, the manager uh, got an instance instantiated for it. Um, the instance type was, uh, you know, this default instance type that we pick, uh, as well as, you know, we had to choose NOS, so we chose Ubuntu 18.04 as the default. Uh, you can, of course, set it to any of the supported OSs we uh, we have on our compatibility matrix. We're, we'll pick a um, uh, an AMI that that works and uh, that's that's known to be supported, uh, that's available, uh, and then we install everything else uh, on top of that for you. So, um, you know, if you need to bring your own uh, AMI uh, to the cluster, you know, we can override this and say the explicit AMI that you need. Uh, so that's great, but how do I actually access it? So I mentioned that we have these things called contexts. So right now I'm talking to the, the default uh, context that um, I'm connected to uh, locally on my Docker desktop. But what I want to do is I want to use this demo uh, context, which is the uh, one for this cluster. So first, you know, just with the default context, we'll take a look and see that I have, you know, a couple of containers running. One is uh, the one that's provisioning the cluster in the background, um, and another is a, a vault server I have running locally. Uh, but what we really want to do is take a look at the cluster. So Docker context use demo, just like that. We're switched to the demo, and we can see that by uh, doing a PS and taking a look and see all these wonderful UCP uh, containers running. We can also do Docker info and see that uh, the server is running 33 containers. And, you know, it's got all of its uh, supporting information uh, in the cloud. And where's all this uh, stored? Is it just in the command line, the, the inspect? What am I inspecting? when you right right so uh in the docker folder um we have uh we have some metadata that we keep uh in in the background of the set of clusters you have uh the uh information for those clusters like your inventory uh ssh keys uh, that we generate for you uh, to just make it all as, as seamless and simple as possible and additionally uh you can take this and and use the underlying tools that we use if you need to, you know, like migrate to uh, some other system. Right. Um, is this something like how would a team, how would a team of ops people use it? If it's, if I'm trying to think, if, it, if it's stored locally, is there an option for like a remote store or something? Right. So uh, to do a remote state storage um, in this iteration, there's not, but we're uh, we're hard at work at uh, defining an API set. Uh, um, that'll make it easy for someone to uh, share uh, the entire uh, set of functionality here at, at an organization, team, and individual level. Cool. Um, yeah. And what versions of Docker are is this capable of deploying? Uh, so the ones that we support are uh, Docker Enterprise 3.0. Uh, that's the Engine 1903, UCP 3.2, and DTR 2.7. Okay, and and I'm assuming you specify the I didn't I missed it in the file, but in the YAML you're specifying that. So like a future version, you can you can define which versions and all that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So here's the 1903. Um, you can use yeah. uh, some additional uh, information here to drill down into say a test channel if you're testing one of our betas, um, and you can you know specify the uh, like, let's say you were putting your UCP containers on an internal registry, you could modify this to, uh, you know, have your own registry uh, uh, reference to, to access. Um, are you, there's a, gr a great question actually in um, chat mm -hmm. about uh, basically how would this be different than doing it in Puppet or another uh, you know, like Terraform or something like that. Is there, um, 
an advantage to this method? Um, the, uh, the, the primary advantage is that we've already done that work for you. <laughs> so you can just go ahead and start uh, defining your uh, cluster topology. But underneath the hood, uh, you know, very similar tools are being used. Uh, I think we're using Terraform to uh, create the resources. Um, so we're actually building out, you know, all those configurations behind the scenes. Um, we're, we built out a set of Ansible rules and uh, playbooks to drive that. So from that Docker container, you can uh, copy out those things and, um, and integrate them into your system uh, if necessary. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Um, and then you mentioned providers. Uh, are there what are the providers you have at launch? Right. So at launch, we launched with AWS. Uh, I believe in this next patch release for 1903.2, uh, we'll be including the uh, Azure support. Uh, and then hot on its heels, we'll be working on vSphere to be able to, to do on-prem deployments as well. All right. Um, what else? Oh, so this is with Docker Desktop Enterprise, right? This is an uh, enterprise. Yep. Uh, well, of course, this is for deploying uh, server enterprise. So, <laughs> so right. uh, it it would make more sense for someone who's yeah running do desktop enterprise. So they get this, and this is a command line plugin, right? Which we kind of talked right. a little bit about plugins yesterday. So, if you're unfamiliar with plugins, uh, the plugin model is one where the Docker command line now. Um, the Docker engine has had something called plugins for a while, but the command line now has plugins so that you can add extra functionality. And to, uh, a sneak hint at tomorrow is that we will have some other people on that show you how to make your own command line plugins uh, to do basically whatever you want inside the Docker command line and essentially a writing apps or scripts at the command line that have access to the Docker functionality without you having to manually create all, that, uh, all those API calls and stuff like that. So it's pretty neat. Um, and so this is taking advantage of that, it looks like. And yep, all the plugins are uh, bundled in with the uh, enterprise uh, deliverable. So if you are installing the enterprise engine on on a node, you can then use that as sort of a jump box to then you know create the rest of your cluster. Yeah, pretty cool. And um, is this something where if it fails at some point, it, it's sort of uh, you can start where you left off if you just re keep rerunning the command kind of thing? Yeah, it'll try to refresh its state from the previous run and then match up to the desired state um, so that you are, uh, you know, not building a whole bunch of new clusters. Um, but if you do try to create another cluster like uh, that was up here before, um, then, of course, it will try to, you know, create another Brett. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Um, really cool. Do you have anything else to show us? Um, you know, that, that's sort of the highlights. Uh, I can show you that it's, uh, it's all... It makes it so easy that you know you can kind of create these clusters and and uh, and get rid of them very quickly. Um, so if you just need to like try something out, uh, but don't want to pay for the the, uh, the cloud provider fees, you know, it's really quick to just say Docker cluster, remove the demo, and then all you know it's going to go through and start tearing it down. Um, so it's it's creating everything you need. Uh, from the VPC to the subnet to the security groups to the instances, uh, additional storage uh, for your Docker volume, uh, like varlib Docker. Um, it's trying to use the, the best uh, storage driver we can of Overly 2. Um, and, uh, you know, for UCP, it'll set everything up that you need. Uh, for DTR, it'll even set up like S3 object storage for you. So it, it works very hard to try to make it as easy as possible to get, you know, our, our best practices in place. Right. Yeah, that, that's really cool. That, that was definitely in line with the goals of the DCI originally. And um, one of the reasons I, li I liked the idea and the concept uh, a year ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So I think yesterday uh, when we had Ben on, we talked about, in case you're interested in Docker Desktop Enterprise, this is, since it uh, is the, sort of the enterprise side on your on your desktop from the server enterprise stuff, the Docker uh, enterprise cluster stuff that you're seeing us build here. Um, if you have more questions about how to get 
uh, get a copy of this or how to get a demo of Docker Desktop Enterprise and stuff like that. Um, uh, yesterday, we talked about reaching out to your exist- whoever you're already getting Docker Server Enterprise. I know it's not called that, but that's how we have to distinguish the difference between the desktop and the server. But um, so if you have this, if you have Server Docker Enterprise today, uh, then yeah, reach out to whoever your contact is, whether that's Docker directly or your partner that you're working with, and you can find more out about all the new features in Docker Desktop Enterprise. And um, if you have any other questions, we will be hanging out, Joe will be hanging out on the call for the next, for the remainder. Um, but yeah, and we're going to jump back over to the three of us. And so we're going to hop over, and we, we mentioned context in that little demo, and Marcos, uh, who is one of the co-founders of Play With Docker and Play With Kubernetes, if you're familiar with that. Um, we talk about that tool all the time on this show and in my courses and all the workshops that everyone I know uh, in, the, in the captain's community, you know, always use, using Play With Docker to, you know, share our examples and to show people cool stuff. So thanks again, Marcos, for having a lot of beers one night and you and Jonathan figuring out how to make that thing uh, work in a matter of hours. It was pretty great. And so here we are years later. It is the standard tool now for playing around with Docker without having to put it on your own machine. Um, so you're going to show us off some of the, the new features at the command line for moving around between different environments. So take it away. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Brett. So happy to be here once again in the show. Uh, as you said, like a uh, happy, uh, still help the like, community and people like to, to get involved with Docker, you know, uh, through play with Docker or either through play with Kubernetes. That is a project that we started with Jonathan, like a couple of years ago, 2015, if I recall correctly. And uh, it's being used like a lot, still a lot. Uh, we're having like uh, thousands of visits uh, per day. And uh, we are still running it in conferences. So the past DockerCon in San Francisco, all the workshops were using uh, the underlying Play With Docker infrastructure. So we are really happy to, to yep. still be helping and fostering, you know, the community and people who want to learn, especially in, in like places where the, the connection is not really good, like uh, India uh, or maybe some other countries. Uh, people find like really interesting cases to run stuff in Play With Docker, right? From yeah, either like con containers or maybe mines and bitcoins and stuff. But uh, <laughs> I was getting ready yeah, to say, we, or any, you were saying where there's not stable internet. And I was like, or any conference that you've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> that so that is a, correct. Yeah, it's, uh, it really helps us at DockerCon too, because we got hundreds and hundred, uh, hundreds of people all at the same time uh, using Play With Docker. Yeah, I, I was running a workshop at DockerCon and um, uh, we, we were trying to download a uh, a .NET uh, container image, and it just it was just killing the the Wi-Fi connection. And so someone suggested we go on to play with Docker, and of course, you know, within an instant, it was able to pull those large containers. So yeah, yeah, they keep promising that the next gen uh, uh, Wi-Fi is going to allow uh, multiple connections instead of one person talking at a time. It's going to allow a bunch of different people talking at a time to the same AP. So maybe that will be the future because every time we upgrade our Wi-Fi and cellular, we're always like, okay, now conferences are no longer a problem, and then there's still a problem. So um, yeah, there's something. There's always something, right? Yeah. So, anyways, uh, back to uh, context switching. So, Joe like actually made like a, a good introduction, uh, like the way that they are using it for uh, UCP and uh, cluster deployments. So, I'm gonna share my screen now. I'm gonna try to explain how that works a little bit in depth. So, let me try to. I think I can share because you already have the screen, right? Oh, Joe, are you still sharing? Oh, am I? Okay, I can stop. Maybe. I'm not sure how that works. I'm drinking mate, by the way. I'm based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, as you know. The mate uh, man. There we go. Yeah. I stopped. It's good stuff. Uh, let me see if this lets me share now. Share screen. Yes, I have it now. So you should be able to see my screen yep. now. Can you see? There it? we go. Yep. Okay, so I'm in my terminal, and the first thing that you're gonna see in the new Docker 1903. Uh, is the Docker context command, right? So the Docker context command, it basically allows you to do like several things. So it allows you to create a context, uh, export and import context. These are pretty much straightforward. I'm not gonna go into these ones. Uh, it will allow you to inspect the constant, uh, context, uh, list all the context that you have, uh, delete, update, and use the context. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically do Docker context ls to see what we have in a, like, in a basic Docker installation. So basically, you're going to see that you have one context by default, which is the default context. 
and it basically points to your uh, Unix uh, domain socket in the, in the local machine. In this particular case, it's also it also has like a Kubernetes uh, endpoint because I have a kube config in my uh, computer, right? Uh, if you don't have a kubectl or anything, this will show uh, like empty. But in my particular case, I'm using Kubernetes for for my daily work, which uh, by the way I, I work at at Site, which is a cloud services uh, platform, and I we use Kubernetes regularly and Docker as well. And as you can see in my prompt, I have configured my Kubernetes context here, so that's why it shows here in the Kubernetes CLI. So if you use uh, Kubernetes, uh, Docker context automatically like integrates with that, and it will like uh, allow you to deploy your Docker workloads in Kubernetes. If that is the way that, that you want to do. So uh, I use the default context, uh, so I can do Docker PS. This will be using my local daemon. But now let's say that I want to connect to another Docker daemon, right? So the way that we did this, the, uh, we did this in the past is like by setting the Docker host environmental variable like this. Yeah, we could use like uh, TCP, some IP, whatever, uh, to uh, 376, if it is the SSL endpoint. Six and then do Docker PS or whatever, right? This will tell that that it can yeah. connect. So we ended up with right. like long commands, or we had to like have a bunch of different windows open with different environment variables each, and it was always fi weird to figure out which one you were on. And yeah, 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 it's it, it works, right. but it, yeah, it could be could be yeah, better. it works, but it but it could be better. I mean, especially uh, now that Kubernetes allows like easy context switching. Like if I do, for example, kubectl get config get context. You can see that I have a bunch of contexts uh, in my computer. So I can like, as you can see, we have like several regions in, in, in my company. So I can actually go ahead and switch to any context and basically run any command there. So it would be nice to do the same thing with Docker, right? So uh, with the Docker context command, I can actually do that now. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to play with Docker and I'm gonna create an instance there. Hopefully this site works. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter if you don't see the the, the, the browser because I'm just creating a, a play with Docker terminal here and I'm, and I'm just going to copy the, the URL of the session of that uh, daemon, basically. So little, this is the whole thing. That's a little thing. SSH URL, right? So if you're on play with Docker, you see that little SSH URL in the interface. Yes, that's correct. So this is the little, let me try to add some zoom into this. So this is the SSH URL, but I'm just going to copy the host name here. I don't mind the, the oh, complete okay. SSH command. So I'm, I copy the, the SSH command. So what I, what I should be able to do here is I can set up Docker host equals TCP, right? Like the traditional way, uh, 2375. And I should be able to do a Docker PS, right? So here, as you can see, I did a Docker PS, but pointing my local CLI to the play with Docker daemon. So if I do, for example, Docker run, I'm gonna just run an Nginx and expose, uh, expose the port. This container is going to be uh, running on my Play With Docker instance. So if I go to my playground, you're going to see that the port got exposed here because uh, I'm pointing to the, to the local daemon. And of course, I'm going to be able to access the Nginx uh, service that I expose. That easy with Play With Docker. Anyways, um, what about if I don't remember the IP or uh, as you said, Brett, if I have like multiple contexts or multiple sessions and I need to start playing with this like uh, better, right? Like uh, in, a, in a different way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this URL and I'm gonna use a new Docker context command to actually save this context into my local daemon. So I'm gonna do Docker context create. We're gonna see a little bit what the options here are. So basically you can configure the context for both Docker endpoints and Kubernetes endpoints as I showed earlier. So whenever you set Docker endpoint, you can either like configure the host name, uh, which is the one that we're gonna use now. You can copy the uh, context information from another context, and that's something that I also going to show. And of course you can uh, set up the certificates because if you wanna talk to a, like a, an SSL daemon, you need to uh, specify the certificates as well. And you have an additional option to ver uh, skip the SSL verification in case mm. you don't have like uh, trusted certificates. Same applies for Kubernetes. You can either import the Kubernetes option from a different context. You can use a kubeconfig file where all the certs are there. And then you can override the, the Kubernetes context and the Kubernetes namespace because whenever you set up a context, you need to tell 
the Docker context, okay, I'm going to talk to this Kubernetes endpoint, but I'm going to talk to this specific Kubernetes context and Kubernetes namespace, right? Cool. And here are, here are some examples of, of uh, how to basically do it. Uh, are you following so far? Yeah. Nice. So now we're going to create a context, like a simple Docker context. So I'm going to do Docker context create, and I'm going to basically set up a Docker context. And for this, I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to use the host, and I'm going to just paste, did I copy it correctly? No, I didn't. I'm going to paste the uh, play with Docker endpoint, which I'm going to copy right now. So let me try to see. Yeah, Docker context. I'm going to clear this. Docker context create. Docker from a uh, host. I'm going to paste this. And I'm going to name this context. This context, this context is going to be called play with Docker. As you can see, Docker context says that it created the context. So if I do Docker context less now, I should be able to see the default context and the play with Docker one. So now what I can do is I can do Docker context uh, use to switch my context. And I, I can say, OK, I'm going to use the play with Docker context now. And I can do Docker PS. And I should be able to see the Nginx container running, which is running here in play with Docker this port. So if I do Docker, uh, let's say, rm f this container, which is running on play with Docker, you're going to see that the container got killed. So if I do Docker PS here, I don't see anything running. See? Yeah. So this is how easy you can actually like connect to a different context and manipulate your containers running there with a with a Docker context command like a, in a two or three steps. Three steps. It's super easy. Yeah. Is that is that in the background actually changing the environment variable for Docker host, or is it just now that the Docker command line is always looking at that com those config files to see which one's current? Like, good question, Brett. So how all this works? So, like this, the same thing as everything everything else works in Docker. What this does under under underneath is like it goes to your Docker like uh, configuration folder, and it will create a new folder that is called contexts. In this particular folder, you have a meta uh, folder where you have like a hash of the context that you created. In this uh, in this uh, particular path, you're going to see a meta.json file, and this JSON file actually has all the information required for the daemon to connect. So whenever you specify a context, what what this is doing underneath is like reading that file, getting the host name. Of, the, of this file, and then sending this host name through the local CLI so it connects to the remote daemon, basically. So it's not set, setting a, like a variable, but it's just reading this file and yeah. injecting this host name in the underlying Docker CLI, basically. Yeah, it's cool. Does it, does, I mean, this is sort of a random question. I've, I've got a th bunch of thoughts here. Is if you, if you end up setting the Docker host, does that win? Is there, is there a, can they fight against each other? Uh, what was the question, sorry? Oh, well, I'm just thinking like, because you previously, you set the Docker host environment variable. So if that's already set, does it win over context or? Uh, that's a good question. I would yeah. guess that it would win, but we can try it out. So let's say Docker context LS, uh, Docker context. So I mean the play with Docker context. Let's try to override this. Let's try to use, for example, my local machine, uh, Unix. This is three bars, right? Bar. Yeah, and I was going to say, even if it was wrong, you'd know, because <laughs> it, it would give you an error just right away. It would say, yeah, yeah this doesn't correct. work, right? So we can do Docker PS uh, dash A, and yes, it overwrites the context, yeah. basically. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of like, I guess, the nice thing here is that basically it's not going to break. Like, if you have an existing workflows that are depending correct. on that environment variable, it won't break them. It, it'll only work, I guess, when that one's either empty or or uh, not set or something. Um, is, is there a way to use context uh, in, like we do with kube control, where we can specify it in the command line, or do we have to set it first and then, like your example? No, there is. So I can actually, there's a docker-c. So you can mm. do docker-c default, docker-ps, for example. And this will talk to my, uh, is it context, maybe? Docker context default. Uh, dash mm. text. I'm sorry? Uh, I think it's uh, dash dash context. And then, uh, yeah. That's, dash dash context, uh, default, uh, PS. Yeah, that is it. I added an, an extra yeah. here. Yep. I think it's yeah. dash C as well. Yeah. 
Ah, yeah, okay. So Docker Crash C default and the command. So inspect PS or whatever. And this basically overrides the uh, the context that you have set by, by default, basically. Yeah, that's really that's handy. So yeah, so using both of them. It's mm -hmm. pretty great. This is pretty cool actually because uh, let's say that you want to run a container in all the context that you have because you, you want to do some like a troubleshooting job or whatever, like run something, you can do for C in Docker context uh, ls dash q the same the same thing as docker ps uh, do for example and then you can do docker dash c context ps for example yeah so this basically <laughs> yeah if you run this it's gonna like loop through all your context and run a command through your all the all your docker CLIs basically yeah that's pretty which yeah, is that's which is pretty cool. cool see so now i have the output in both of my uh, containers so I can do docker run hello world and this will run hello world in my machine and it will run it also in play with docker uh, yeah I was gonna say that's a pro tip for those of you that haven't heard it on uh, either the show or wherever we, we talk about we talk about command line stuff that in the do any of the docker well not all of them but a lot of the docker commands a dash q for quiet actually allows you to do these really nice little one liner bash scripts and stuff because it, right. it basically pumps out just the ids or the the thing you need in order to talk to that so it, it's great that i would have never thought of using it with context but that's a really cool uh, cool scenario or you know and you yeah, can filter those nice. obviously so here as you can see yeah it only prints the name of the context so i can just easily look through that and then run something in parallel through all the clusters that i have which is pretty cool. Um, the last thing that I would like to show you is uh, one, one another thing which is pretty recent in Docker is that you can actually, I'm gonna ask a question for you and for the audience that you might know already. So what, which is like the, the best way to connect to a remote Docker daemon securely? Um, well, previously it was TCP, right? TCP with TLS, but right. that there's a new place. Mm -hmm. There's a new place. <laughs> there's a new thing. There's a new thing uh, which landed on 1809, yep. and now it has been like enhanced by the 1903, which is uh, SSH basically uh, connection, remote connection through, uh, through the CLI. So how does that work? So pretty much everyone here, like before actually is installing Docker or whatever, need to provision a machine, right? So you need to launch a machine in any cloud or whatever, and then you need to SSH to, to that machine to do some stuff. So in this particular case, I already have a machine running uh, in the cloud. So I'm going to SSH through it by m using my uh, .ssh config file, right? So for those who don't know, uh, that don't know what, what this file is, basically in your, in pretty much every uh, configuration, you have a config file that basically lists all the uh, machines that you have in remotely. So this is the public IP and this is the uh, key that I'm using to access that machine. So by having this, I can easily access that machine by using SSH, AWS, labs, jump, jump. So basically SSH will read that configuration file and it will just connect to that machine, right? Uh, directly by using all the parameters that I have there, the public IP, the keys and, and, and everything. So one nice thing, nice thing that Docker has and specifically Docker context is that I can say Docker context create and I'm gonna name this context SSH I'm going to create a Docker context again. And uh, what we can do here is in host, we can actually use SSH and we can use the name of the config host that I have in my file. So I can do AWS labs, labs jump here, right? And that's pretty much it. So now I can switch to that, to that context, Docker context use SSH, and I can do Docker PS. Let's do Docker run, hello world here. Uh, Typo. So what this yeah. is doing, yeah. this That's is cool. connecting, I'm, I'm gonna show what's happening here. So this is connecting through the remote or to the remote Docker daemon through SSH, not through TLS, and it's running the container there. So I don't need to like either expose Docker ports to the world. I don't need to set up any SSL certificates or any CAs or whatever. This is just using like plain SSH connection, my the way that I usually go to that servers. So now that I'm in the server here at the pane in the bottom, I can do docker ps dash a, and you can see that the hello world container just run there, which is pretty, pretty amazing because I don't need to do any extra steps or whatever anymore. Um, 
One last comment uh, about this is that you can actually do it without like, you can actually use this today if you don't have like 1903 by setting up the Docker host to uh, SSH. You can either use a name that I, uh, that I use here or you can use like user at IP, for example, right? Yeah. So I can do, I can do the same here, same here. And you just need to make sure that the keys, if you're using it this way, you just need to make sure that the keys that this user has are already in your SSH agent, because otherwise uh, SSH will not know which keys to use basically to connect to this endpoint. Yeah. If I remember correctly, this method doesn't work yet if you are using password-based SSH, which none of you should be, but uh, is that still true? I, think, I don't think they've changed that. Yes, that's correct. This will only work if you're using like a key-based uh, access right. to, the, to the machine. Which which we should all be using. I mean, you can obviously use password to get a key uh, into the accepted keys list, but um, this is really cool. And when it first came out uh, last fall, I... I wouldn't shut up about it. Like I was telling everybody, like it was the it was the solution to all problems, and uh, so many people I think are basically to me what the SSH ability in context just makes it even easier to use because basically we can now I can never remember what's in my SSH uh, config file, right? Because there's so much stuff in your SSH config, it's like yeah, I can never remember all the things in there. So having it in the context list means I don't have to leave my Docker command line to remember. Okay, what was the name of that server that I called it in SSH? Um, but I, to me, what this is going to do is this This is really going to help us prevent Docker from uh, people from inadvertently exposing unsecure TCP connections or insecure TCP connections on mm -hmm. their Docker engines. Because that, do, that does get a little bit of heat, right? Like um, we, uh, we, we have had people that you know, there have been reports that Docker is exposed on the Internet or Kubernetes is exposed on the Internet. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I think that. A lot of that has to do with, you know, people basically doing this. Like, they need to remote into a server. They don't want to SSH in, so they do the TCP way. And now, you know, as of eight months ago, really, we don't need that anymore. We have this SSH ability, and the context makes it even easier. So, um, sorry, I switched away from your screen screen share. Were you done there? Um, just one last, last thing that I wanted to oh. show is okay. that, um, let's say that you want to create a context for Kubernetes, but you still want to use like your regular Docker stuff, like your regular Docker context, you can just use uh, one flag from Docker context create, which is, uh, this is taking so long because my local CLI is pointing to my SSH uh, right. stuff. Right, your remote server, yeah. Uh, yeah, one one nice feature that I, that I would like to see is that uh, there's a plugin, for example, for Kubernetes that prints the context that you're using. It would be nice if we can ha have like a Docker prompt also. So it tells you in which Docker context you are. So is there, a way, is, is, there, is there a way to return current context and then... Um... Yeah, if you do the Docker context the less, this will tell you uh, the context that you're using has a star here. So okay. I don't know if there's, there's a way to tell, give me the current context. Yeah. Only. Because if, if he did, uh, I, I was just thinking this. I was actually thinking um, it would be cool to put out a one-liner on how to add your Bash or ZSH profile to, to yeah, have but your current if, context if the, show in there. But if the CLI knows, there should be a way to know which context you're using. Yeah. Uh, we need to we need to see how, how the CLI actually does it. Like, yeah, current or, yeah. Yeah, because Kubernetes has it, but I don't know uh, if you can do it with Docker. Maybe Joe knows. That's a good idea. I like this. Yeah, I'm trying to see if there's a way to filter. Um, I mean, you can grab, but nice. So Joe is, is looking at looking up for us. Uh, yeah. In any yeah, case, I was going to say it would be cool. So, yeah, if we had like a just a separate command that we could pipe in, right. you know, we could throw into a there that would just return the name instead of a second extrapolate. Context. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that uh, oh, yeah. what I want it's uh, ls dash. Well, ls dash q might give you all of them. Yeah, it yeah. would give you all of them. Oh, so that's, I see what you're saying. So do a dash Q and then a filter on, maybe there's a filter on current? I think you don't have a filter here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, just format. Anyways. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what I wanted to show is, uh, let's say that you want to create a new context, uh, Docker, let's say context create. And then I'm going to set up like Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes has like a config file or something. Let me... There's a configures uh, create 
I don't do this with Kubernetes a lot. So you can say Kubernetes endpoint like here, and then you can say config file, yeah. So you can, let's say that I want to use Kubernetes config file, some file, some file, and then I want to reuse the Docker context that I'm using in my default context, for example, because I don't want to like set up the host again. So what I can do is I can set up like doc, dash dash docker, and I can tell this guy from default, like, right? and this default is like another context that I have. And I need to specify a name, which I didn't do. Uh, it's not Kubernetes. I always have the same typo. Uh, and let's create like a test. So what this is going to do is it's going this is going to create a new context. But I didn't find the file. Doesn't doesn't matter. This is going to create a new context, but it's going to reuse the Docker information that I have in my default context. So I can remove the Kubernetes part just to show how it works. And this uh, basically context was created. So if I if I do Docker context use test and I do Docker PS, this will talk to my local daemon because I configure the Docker context to use the same context than the, the default context basically, which is my local machine. So that's also a pretty neat uh, addition that you can like easily alias uh, the, either the Docker or the Kubernetes context from a different, any other context that you have in your machine. Yeah. So that's uh, pretty much uh, what I want to show today. Like yeah, uh, really lots cool. of uh, interesting tooling around like fiddling with the Docker CLI. Yeah, um, and I think that we're going to get a lot more. Uh, you know, the, the more we we all we all start using Docker in production, and the more and we've got these, you know, the Docker and the Cube Control uh, command lines. The more that you know, creating a bunch of environment variables and scripts to change environments, because that's what I see. I see, uh, you know, I, I've worked with teams for years, and you know, they have like a DevOps repo that'll have some scripts in there, and the scripts will essentially do what this context stuff was doing for them with the all the environment variables you need and they'll plug that into and there's probably third party tools out there now that do it as well um and it's great to see that now uh finally come in is and i maybe i missed this part when you set the docker context does that also set the context for cube control or is that totally separate no that's a totally separate thing okay that would be cool if that was an option to like have the the docker set the cube control for you so you had a one-liner um, for everything, because mm -hmm. yeah. you usually, when you change the Docker context, you usually want both to be talking to that same server, like a, a dash, a dash K, which also includes the context change for Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> I've already got a thousand features we need to add to this, and it just it just showed up. But you know, we need we need version two now. <laughs> uh, I was I was while you were talking, I was actually on the Moby Moby. Um, issues list seeing who who did the pr for context to see if see if i could uh ping them directly from a new issue on the idea here of uh doing a quiet uh, a quiet of the current context so that we could uh pipe that into some sort of uh bash automation because yeah, i'm, all, I'm nice. all about that uh i term on mac recently added a whole new functionality of having this python command line tooling all in the the ui so you can add all this automation so that's not in each one of your it's not in your prompt. It's actually in your shell screen, so that you can get all of this kind of stuff that uh, your, you know, your Git branch and all that stuff right inside of your shell. So it's not constantly being pumped out on your command line. It makes it a little bit cleaner uh, when you like a when you like a tiny shell prompt. Uh, it's a it's a cleaner way to do it. So I'm I'm sitting here thinking I might have to work on that sometime soon. So, um, cool guys, uh, this has been great. Let me go, let's see if we've got any questions. So this is the perfect time, because we only got a few minutes left. If you have any questions on these new features or frankly, any other new features in Docker 1903, uh, to throw those in there. Um, we had some questions about, is Marcos using Docker CE? I actually replied, yes, because you're on a Linux desktop and I assumed you were using CE, right? Yes, I'm um, using Docker CE on my machine. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to actually use Docker desktop ever, never in my life. I wish I could to provide feedback and, and try it out, but uh, yeah, it's just plain Docker C. Yeah, well, the question yesterday for Ben was, you know, the, the question you always get whenever you talk about new releases of Docker Desktop was, uh, one of them was, when are we going to get Docker Desktop for Linux? And then someone specifically said, when are we going to get Docker Desktop for Ubuntu? <laughs> and people started specifying <laughs> distributions. And of course, uh, the, the answer is, as soon as all of you gather together on the internet and 
you know, petition Docker to do so, right? So it's all it's all a question of how many people want it, how many people are going to use it, and um, it hasn't been. Even though there are those people asking for it, there hasn't been a, a large outcry enough to really motivate the, you know, for a whole team to create a whole new app for Linux uh, in a GUI. So it's not a it's not a no. It's just not yet. So uh, for those of you asking or thinking of that, since we were watching that <laughs> wonderful Linux shell on Marcus's uh, machine. By the, Brett, uh, by the way, Brett, I have the answer to the questions regarding the current context uh, that is selected. Yeah. So if you go to yeah to your config.json file, which I'm not going to show because it has my uh, hub yeah. keys, right. there's a value in that JSON which says current context, and it will give you the name that. of the context. So there's a way to know. Yeah, so there's a config. So for those of you who don't know, um, actually, uh, and I, uh, I can show mine real quick so people... Uh, yeah, or I let me I I can like I can uh, my... Uh, comment my 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 Docker like uh, have key. Give That's me okay, I got it. Oh, um, nice, cool. Yeah, because mine's using the the Mac store, so it it's doesn't have to have the key in there. Yeah. Um, nice. So yeah, uh, basically, if you're not familiar, your your command line on any Docker command line has a config file that controls how your uh, your command line's working. Or yeah. And um, so there's cool things that have been added. A lot of stuff's actually been added in the last year to this because um, you now can define w when you're doing Docker, like Docker stacked commands, you, you can actually deploy those stacks now to Kubernetes. So there's such a thing as a stack, a default stack orchestrator. So you can, you can say, I want Kubernetes when I do a Docker stack deploy to actually talk to Kubernetes. So that's a pretty cool thing. Most people don't know about that. Um, but yeah, one of the things here would be a default context, which I don't have one set because... I just installed the brand new 1903 release and it wiped out my config because I had an old beta. Um, so yeah, that nice. would normally, that would be stored in there. And yeah. Yeah, so, there's a current context key uh, there that has the name of the context. Yeah. Yes. If it's absent, I think it's because it's using the default, but through uh, mm -hmm. JQ or some simple scripting, you could probably get it so that the current context is being yeah. displayed. That's a, that's a, I'm sure that someone that's watching live or in the next 20 minutes on Twitter will give us a one-liner that uses <laughs> JQ with pulling out this JSON file and finding the default context and putting it in every shell command. So make it happen, Internet. Um, well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining the call today. Um, I, think we're, I think we're good on all the questions. Yeah, uh, Daniel's saying would be nice if it was cross... I think, I think Daniel's talking about... Cross-platform by default, you think he's talking about Docker Desktop. But the challenge about Docker Desktop is that it's very heavily built into the virtualization and administration and root stuff of each system. So uh, it's not like it could just be an Electron interface that is just a GUI, because it's, it's way more than that on the internals. So I imagine if they did one for Docker, if, if you're talking about for Linux, it would have to be a, almost a complete rewrite from the, the ground up there to work on each OS, because on Mac, it has to deal with Mac-specific stuff and Mac networking and all that. So... Um, but yeah, too bad. Too bad we don't have it for everyone. Um, all right, <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up because we've been here chatting for a while. Thank you so much for uh, for attending and watching. If you uh, thanks to my guests Marcos and Joe. If you are interested in any more of this stuff, of course you can always go to Docker's website. You can find my YouTube at uh, brettfisher.com/slash/youtube, and of course all my stuff is at brettfisher.com. You can just hang out there for five minutes and find a ton of stuff on Docker courses, all that kind of stuff, links to play with Docker for demos. And um, we will be back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. So that's like uh, 5 p.m. UTC, I think. And so if you're on YouTube's, on either Docker's channel or my channel, you'll see another event in the list on those pages. And we'll be back here talking about more about plugins and command line stuff and also rootless docker which is something that is mm. just this year been a big deal um that's been added into docker as a feature an experimental feature so yeah that's that's gonna be cool to talk about user-based docker demons instead of um root-based docker demons so nice. um, real quick marcos where can people find you on the internet or reach out if they have questions sure uh you can find me at uh at marcos Niels. that will be m-a-r-c-o-s-n-i-l n-i-l-s uh twitter facebook uh, whatever you like mostly there. Uh, yeah, and I'm also in the Docker community Slack if you want to ping me uh, through a DM or something. Any questions or regarding play with Docker or whatever, just I'm, I'm all around. Yeah, so if you don't know about Docker community chat, uh, that's the Slack 
community. Tons, tens of thousands of people in there. Go check that out. Uh, Joe, where can people find you? Yeah, pretty much the same places. I'm uh, Joe Abbey, um, and you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, uh, community chat, or you know various other corners of the internet. Great. All right. Well, we're all all three of our Twitter handles are down here on the screen. So if you miss those, they've been there the whole time. Um, I didn't just make those up. And we will be again back here tomorrow and we'll be wrapping up the week of 1903. And I'll see you live tomorrow on the Internet. Thanks. Nice. Ciao.